All right. Welcome to AI in Film and TV. As I just mentioned, I am recording this session. I will post the video later on my YouTube channel. Everybody, as they join, are muted. Please ask any questions in the chat. I will get to them. I will say I bit off more than I could chew with this presentation. There are lots of film and television uh, that involve AI. So um, I have a lot to get through. So we are just going to go ahead and get started. And um, hopefully people will join. And maybe you can check out the recording later if you miss a little bit at the beginning. So really quickly, just to let you know, uh, my name is Matt. I run DiceGeeks.com. I am a writer. Um, I also create tabletop resource, tabletop RPG resource books, uh, fitting for Gen Con. Um, so you are welcome to check those out, but I just wanted to introduce myself. So you're not wondering who this crazy guy on the internet is. All right. Like I said, this has a lot of material, so we're going to move kind of quickly. All right. So first off. Can I move this? All right. So first off, I think it's important to understand where some of our terms come from. So um, robot, the concept of robot in science fiction, kind of this intelligent uh, being or semi-intelligent being that acts as like a servant or something like that, that we see all over in science fiction, uh, didn't really enter science fiction until 1920, the science fiction play by a Czech writer. Um, Rousum's Universal Robots. That's where uh, that kind of concept of a robot really entered into science fiction. And uh, needless to say, people have run with that idea, right? Also, um, artificial intelligence, that term uh, was not coined until 1955 or thereabouts. Uh, that's what uh, that's what the internet told me. So um, that term wasn't coined until 1955. Um, so as we are looking at some of these films, what I wanted to do is I wanted to start kind of way back. And some of these films and television are from the early days of film and the early days of television. And I wanted to look at those because I'm always fascinated with where things originate and how uh, they grow and change um, over time. And like I said, I pack this way too full <laughs> with TV shows and movies about robots, about in, in, you know artificial intelligence. So I'm going to have to fly through some of these. But before we get into some of the movies, um, these are some questions I want to ask. So as writers, as role players, as storytellers, um, you know, I hope that's what we all are, right? I, I'm pretty sure we're all role players. I'm pretty sure we're all game masters, dungeon masters. We're all players um, where many of us I know are writers as well. And so these are some questions that I want to ask as we look at some of these films. Is it actually AI? Is it sentient? How do humans treat it? How does it treat humans, right? These are in, you know, these are important questions that help us kind of frame some of these, right? Um, because if we're not asking those questions, I don't know, you know, we're we're just we're just watching for entertainment, you know, we're not thinking about it, we're not putting, you know, some of this into place. So um all right. Well, in chat, we got some uh, game designers, players, GMs. All right. That's what I wanted to hear. So um, we're going to be asking these questions as we go here and look at these films. Hopefully at the end, we'll have a little bit of time to ask some questions. But like I said, um, I'm going to have to fly through some of these because there are so many. All right. So I wanted to go way back. Um, and start here. So we have a film called The Golem, or Der Golem in German, um, how he came into the world, 1920. So this is the same year, um, or it was released the same year as that play, R-U-R, -R, was released. And I think that's interesting. Now, The Golem, if you've played if you play D&D, &D, you know what a golem is, right? It is a humanoid shape 
that has been imbued with some kind of some kind of intelligence, right? And so we get this film um, kind of based on mysticism and magic. So we get this creation. And my question is, is it AI? Um, it's certainly, you know, it's certainly supernatural intelligence. It's certainly artificial in that sense. Is it intelligence? Barely, right? It 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 needs commands, and it just follows its master's commands um, quite you know rigidly um, in, in that. And I thought that was interesting. So I don't know if that plays into our imagination in you know in ro when thinking about robots or thinking about AI. But I wanted to mention it, and hopefully you will find some awesome films and TV shows that you can go back and watch because uh, Dragolum here is available on YouTube for free. Obviously it's so old, it's in the public domain and you can watch it for free. Um, it is, it is interesting to say the least. All right. So here we get another, another classic from the silent film era, right? We get Metropolis 1927 now, this one is very clearly some type of robot, some type of artificial intelligence, right? We have, um, you can see the picture of this being right here. Um, in the film, the film is interesting because uh, the robot the is often called the mechanical man, um, but it looks clearly female, and then it is made to represent a female to try to uh, trick our protagonist later on and to lead everybody to ruin. <laughs> um, and so this is very classic. Um, the you know classic film. Um, there are also some connections, right? The cinematographer on the Golem is the cinematographer here on Metropolis as well. Um, and so uh, Carl Frund, uh, if you know Carl Frund, his work is amazing. Um, he directed The Mummy, the original 1932 uh, Mummy. Um, he also ended his career on I Love Lucy, giving I Love Lucy that amazing black and white film uh, look that, that he was an expert at. So we get Metropolis here. Um, hopefully everybody's seen Metropolis. This is another easy one. It's on a lot of streaming platforms. It's on YouTube. It is available because it, um, I believe it has lapsed into the public domain. Um, so this is one to consider. Obviously here, this robot has some type of, or they call it the mechanical man, has some type of intelligence. Is it sentient? I, I don't know, right? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, definitely some kind of, you know, intelligence, but it seems to be just acting on its creator's wills. All right, Frankenstein. So I threw Frankenstein in here because I, I just happened to recently see an article talking about uh, artificial intelligence and somebody was trying to say that Frankenstein was like the first example of AI. I don't know if I buy that <laughs> um, just yet. Um, I was thinking about it. It's kind of interesting. And so I threw it in here because I was talking about film or TV. And I think the film version of Frankenstein certainly may fit the bill a little bit closer, certainly to AI than um, the book version, though, I mean, you can make the argument, right? It's because it was created by man. Is it then artificial? Uh, these are, you know, I don't know. It's either a complex question or it, I don't know. It, it's some of the stuff, you know, it's either a complex question to answer or we might be splitting hairs. But I was just thinking about it, right? Like, because the film version, right, of Frankenstein is is basically just a brute, right? Uh, in the book, Frankenstein is reading Paradise Lost and um, and is reasoning and eloquent and all of these things. Um, uh, so he would be in the book, Frankenstein would almost be the AI that we often imagine, right? Um, whereas we usually get the AI that has no will, right? Um, Chat GPT doesn't write on its own, it needs input, so. Just some interesting things to think about. I don't know if Frankenstein would be considered AI. I just thought I'd throw it in um, because it, it, I mean, you know, I like thinking about Frankenstein because it's such an amazing story and um, it's an interesting idea. 
All right, so we have a gap here. We go to 1951, the day the Earth stood still. We have a gap because the world, you know, uh, had had problems in the late 30s and 40s, uh, almost being conquered by a madman and such. So we have kind of a break in our history here with some interesting film and in that. So we we jump ahead to 1951, um, the day the Earth stood still. We get um, kind of... Uh, just an iconic robot in the day the earth stood still his name is gort um and he you know while having you know possessing you know great power and great strength and stuff he still is you know a you know a, a machine that is commanded quite easily right you just need to know the certain command words right what is it klatu brata nikto and he'll he'll stop or or whatever it is you know in the movie so he uh, he has uh, you know a, a vast range of abilities, but he is limited uh, in that regard. All right, Forbidden Planet, nineteen fifty six. We got the robot here. Um, we st started a, a a theme of fainted ladies, I guess. <laughs> I didn't draw the pictures, but here we go. Um, so we get this robot right in Forbidden Planet. If you haven't seen Forbidden Planet, uh, please, please watch Forbidden Planet. Um, Forbidden Planet is great. Uh, again, we get, you know, kind of just this robot who can do many amazing things in in Forbidden Planet, he is a fabricator, right? He can create all kinds of different things and just like, you know, print them out. Maybe it's like an early version of a, th a 3D printer or something like that. Um, but um, this robot can do many of those amazing things. Um, again, keeping with some of our questions that we were asking, not sure if it's sentient, you know, it's just interesting kind of question to ask. How does it treat, how do people treat it? How does it treat us? I mean, it's basically a servant um, in that. So, but a, a very classic portrayal, very interesting film if you have not watched that. All right, now we jump up to 1965. I include this one here, so Lost in Space. I include this one here, not because it, you know, it breaks any ground with the robot, but it's so culturally, um, it's so culturally recognized, right? That um, I mean, I think just the other day, right? You know, somebody does something and somebody says, "Danger, Will Robinson!" Right? Like it just comes out of nowhere um, because it's just uh, you know in our culture so much. And of course, there were film remakes in the '90s, and then a TV show um, uh, a few years back uh, for Netflix, I believe. Um, but the original show, right, not groundbreaking on the robot front, but I think for popularizing, you know, robots, uh, the show is very important. All right. So then we we jump to Star Trek, right? Um, 1966, obviously another television show. Um, I just included, you know, Star Trek. Uh, in a broad way, because there were many instances of AI um, in Star Trek, even though I don't think they ever used that term, right? We have Vol, we have Landru, we have, what is it, Nomad, we have Norman. Um, those are just four that I had been thinking about off the top of my head. Uh, there were probably more. Um Oh, right. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. M5, the, the computer um, uh, that took over in um, in the one episode. Uh, there's also the Andrew, uh, the oh, I just remembered the, there's the Android in um, what little girls are made of played by a famous actor who was who was Lurch, right? Um, so we had a number of different computers, a number of different computers that that ranged, you know, in intelligence. And so this is another one that's kind of interesting here um, with Star Trek is that we break away from the anthropomorphs, you know, the anthropomorphic look, right? Uh, to the, the humanoid look of some of these some of this ai right um 
most up to this point have been humanoid shapes, right? They've been very man-like, very human-like in shape, you know, head, arms, legs, and stuff like this. Um, here in Star Trek, we get a lot of computers that just happen to have higher abilities, right? Um, M5, as somebody mentioned, Vol, Landru is a computer. But then, you know, we do have some of the androids as well, like Norman, um, the one from Little Girl, what Little Girls are made of, um, some of those uh, different ones as well. So this was a show, right, obviously that explored um, AI quite a bit. Um, Ruck, his name was Ruck. That is right. Thank you, chat. Um, and so this is a show that explored it a lot. And obviously, I think went a long way into, you know, popularizing some of these ideas about robots, artificial intelligence, you know, supercomputers. And of course, all this stuff was happening. You know, this is cultural stuff that was happening in the 1960s, right? Computer power was kind of brand new and it's still in its early stages and it was kind of blowing up and everything. So very interesting uh, take here from Star Trek. All right, 2001, A Space Odyssey, 1968. Of course, HAL 9000, right? And thinking about some of our questions, of course, here we are again, you know, doesn't look anything like a person, right? He's just a, a red light bulb. <laughs> you know, is this a red light or a red lens um, in, uh, you know, in a control panel? And... Uh, just thinking about this, right? Like some of my questions that I asked when we first started, right? Like how do people treat it? How does it treat people? Is it sentient? Is it not sentient? And we don't get some, you know, some good answers here, but obviously how does it treat people? This is, we get very clearly, right? That Hal is either malfunctioning or something and he, he thinks he's going to be, you know, turned off, which is probably true. But so he's going to, you know, try to preserve himself at all costs. So we get right the famous "I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that." <laughs> right? You know that that famous line from from Hal um, here in uh, 2001: Space Odyssey. We also get like an extended death scene <laughs> where he sings a song and, and all of that. So um, some interesting portrayal here in uh, 2001. Like I said, I know I'm moving kind of quick. Um, this one, hopefully I'm giving you some new movies to see. Um, this one here, Colossus, the Forbin project. I know this, this uh, poster art here does not tell you anything about AI, right? Like you're like, what is this? Why, why is this in here? If you haven't seen Colossus the Forbin Project, please, 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 please try to see it. I don't know if it's available for streaming anywhere. Um, you've got to see this movie. Um, somebody in chat says classic. This is an absolute classic movie. Um, and it is definitely about AI. Um, so kind of the base concept of this, because I know it's not going to be as popular as some of the other ones that I've talked about. The base concept is, is of course, the United States and the Soviet Union. We're locked in the, you know, the heart, the, the, the depths of the Cold War here. So we are going to create the supercomputer, right? We're going to create the supercomputer that's going to teach us right how to defeat the soviet union and so we don't destroy the world in a nuclear war okay so we build a computer called colossus and then we only to find out that the soviet union has built a almost exact copy of the computer called guardian and um so the two computers, their their directive was like, how do we not allow humans to destroy the Earth in nuclear war? So the two computers talk to each other and they decide what? Well, human beings can't be trusted <laughs> to not destroy the world. So we're going to take it over. And so uh, spoilers to a 50 some year old movie. But hey, um, uh just you know it's still amazing and worth watching and so the computers take over and uh the humans then 
realize what they were doing um, is they can not destroy the world and they don't need this computer now who's going to enslave them. <laughs> you know, these two computers who are basically going to enslave them. They don't need that. Um, fantastic movie. Uh, really fantastic. Um, I hope uh, some people who are on the session right now haven't heard of it so you can go out and watch it. I don't know where it is available. Um, it It is probably available out there somewhere. Great movie. All right, here's another one. Hopefully uh, some people have seen this, but also hopefully I'm, I'm introducing this film to a new audience. So we have Silent Running from 1972, uh, Bruce Dern. Uh, we have, we see the robot right here on the poster art, but there are actually three of them and they are named after uh, Donald Duck, Duck's nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And um, this this is a very interesting film. Um, I, kind of the concept behind this is, um, you know, it doesn't really involve the AI as much, like say, like the Colossus, you know, Colossus the Forbin project was really about the machine, about the supercomputers, super where Silent Running is about how, you know, is about, humanity's short-sightedness how we've destroyed all the forests on earth so we sent forests we put them in a spaceship but now we want to destroy those as well and bruce dern is not having it and um uh he with the help of huey dewey and louie um tries to save the last known vegetation in our solar system here uh very interesting film, very unique. The special effects are incredible uh, for the time. Uh, um, it was directed by Douglas Trimble, who worked on special effects for 2001 on Space Odyssey. Um, the robots, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, are great. Uh, the What they used is they, they used human performers who, who were double amputees. So uh, human performers, so their legs, whose legs had been amputated, and so they walk on their hands in the costumes of the robots. And it gives a very distinct look to the robots, very alien look, you know, like alien in the sense of odd, you know, uh, you know, to us. It gives a very interesting look, and it's like, um, so into keeping with some of my questions, are they sentient? Probably, right? Probably. This is kind of exploring the idea of something is emerging, something, some, you know, somebody didn't plan on having. And we actually get a very interesting scene where he is playing cards with the robots and they actually have little arms that like lay down cards, very similar to um, the scene in Star Trek, The Next Generation, where Commander Data plays cards with uh, the uh, Stephen Hawking on the holodeck. Very similar. I don't know if that was done on purpose or not, but it was kind of weird. Uh, eerily similar um, there. But uh, Silent Running, if you haven't seen it, please check it out. It's very 70s film. It's a very 70s film, but it is an uh, interesting idea. The robots are great. All right, so Westworld. 1973 obviously this enjoyed a a modern remake or reboot or something here just in the last few years or a few years ago um but westworld here um i find it interesting right it this was uh written and directed by michael crichton you may know michael crichton from jurassic park um uh and um this uh, this movie is quite interesting because not only does it talk about AI, it also foreshadows uh, Jurassic Park a bit because we have a theme park where things go wrong. <laughs> and um, Westworld uh, uh, obviously is, is written and directed by Michael Crichton here. And so what we have here is some people may be familiar with the concept of this one, right? We have a Wild West world 
um, where we have animatronic, you know, gunfighters and animatronic Wild West uh, performers, but they uh, they go mad, right? They develop some type of maybe intelligence, maybe sentience. I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know if we've if that has been determined really too much in this, but they go crazy anyway. So one of my questions: How do they treat humans? They want to kill them all. <laughs> That's what they want to do. Um, so Westworld, very interesting film. If you haven't seen the original, maybe you've seen some of the new stuff, but it is a uh, very interesting film. Um, kind of a unique, you know, kind of a, a, a you know, a, a different look at AI here. Um, even though we are going to see, right, AI usually falls into the category of, you know, maybe comic, maybe helpful, and and then it's here to destroy us all. We have <laughs> We have kind of a limited range, actually. All right. I threw this one in. This is a, this is kind of a, hidden gem, if you will, that probably not a lot of people have seen or heard of. This is the Quest War Tapes, 1974. It's a, it was a pilot for a TV show, but it was later turned into a TV movie and um, it wasn't picked up and it didn't go to series. Um, the one notable thing you might have noticed already at the top of the promo poster here is that it was created by Gene Roddenberry, obviously the creator of Star Trek. Um, and uh, why I included this one, even though it wouldn't have very much, a, you know, a popular impact on uh, AI or robots or anything like that, it is going to shape a sentient robot or a sentient android that comes later. And I am sure this is not a spoiler to anyone uh, of who I am talking about. And actually, um, there are some other references in Star Trek uh, TNG to the Quessor tapes in the episode Data Lore, where Lore is introduced um, in the first season. There are some sequences and shots that are just done shot for shot remakes from the quest or tapes um there is also the casino sequence from the tng episode the royale was done in the quest or tapes and the royale just basically does it over again <laughs> just basically does it over again um there is a great youtube channel i i'm not affiliated with it so it's not a promo for me but uh, it is called Meta Trek. If you have not watched that and you're a Star Trek fan, you need to go find Meta Trek on YouTube. Uh, the channel does not have many subscribers, but it needs many, many more. He does a video where he compares some of the footage from the Questor tapes to uh, some of the TNG episodes. Mind blowing, mind blowing that it's just lifted. They just lifted it and just reshot the same shots. It's just. Kind of amazing. So that's why I included the Questor tapes here. Again, the Questor tapes, the android in it is pretty much sentient, kind of trying to understand humans, but he doesn't have emotions. Are we thinking data, right? <laughs> right. Like this was just Roddenberry's precursor to data. Um, it was quite interesting. Uh, it was an interesting idea. And of course, he got to finally develop it with TNG. All right, Star Wars. So I know I throw in Star Wars here. Obviously, everyone has heard of Star Wars. Um, I don't think there would be a person in listening to this who hasn't heard of Star Wars. Um, if you are, I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. But anyway, Star Wars has an interesting way of treating AI, right? It has an interesting way of treating their droids, as they call them. Um, Star Wars right? The droids are what? They are fully sentient. They have the full range of human emotions. You know, not like Data, where he doesn't have emotions. They are, most of them are, you know, or lots of them are anthropomorphic, right? They, you know, uh, the protocol droids tend to be, but other ones are not. But they have full range of human emotions, full range of sentience. They even feel pain. They even feel pain. 
which I think is quite interesting. And then the twist on this, what is the twist on this? They're completely held. Um, they're completely held in servitude or, or slavery, perhaps, right? And nobody bats an eye. Nobody even mentions it. Uh, nobody talks about it. This is the way it goes. Um, they are your property and no no problem, right? They're fully sentient, fully have fully arranged human emotions, can feel pain, and we don't think about it. And they are totally our servants. And we can put restraining bolts on them and we can buy and sell them. No problem. Um uh, I just, I, I just kind of find that fascinating um, in a number of regards, right? Like um, some of the, you know, mo you know, movies and TV shows we've looked at already, and then some we will look at in, the, you know, here in just a few minutes, right? They go to great lengths to kind of talk about, like, oh, is it sentient? How should we treat it? How, you know, if it has emotions, if it has intelligence, if it's self-aware, how should we treat it? Star Wars doesn't, doesn't worry about that at all. It just moves on. Um, that's the way it is. And um, I, I find that fascinating. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody else, when we get to the question part, hopefully we'll get to the questions and we can take some questions. Hopefully, uh, some other people will have some thoughts on that. Um, but I just find it interesting. Like it just never even comes up in the star Wars universe that, um, it's like, Oh, your droid, you just bought, it feels pain. Like if you hit it, it feels pain. Like if it stumbles, right. Because we see, uh, we see them being tortured in Jabba's palace and they scream in pain. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting portrayal of, of, uh, robots and AI and that in the Star Wars universe, almost a unique one, uh, almost a unique portrayal. All right. So Star Trek, the motion picture, obviously um, probably a familiar film to a lot of people at Gen Con, um, or at least uh, of people of a certain age, right? Um, Star Trek, the motion picture, of course, involves V'ger, the super intelligence um, at its core of the film, um, a very unique motion picture in its own right. Um, it was, um, you know, it does have some some throwbacks here right it it uh was directed by robert wise who directed the day the earth stood still um so we have some you know we have a bit of a throwback here so we have a director who has worked with ai in the past <laughs> in a in a story sense um and so we get viger who right he doesn't feel he's complete right which this is now this is an idea right that obviously roddenberry and and star trek is going to pick up with you know in data also we saw it with the quest or quest or tapes right this idea that viger doesn't feel he's complete he has intellectual knowledge he has fact knowledge he can gather all the facts he's seen wonders and 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 you know species and planets and and things that he that he he you know that no other person or no other being has ever seen right and he's seen all of this he has amassed all this factual knowledge right like an encyclopedia but he he lacks something to process it right he lacks emotion maybe he lacks some kind of human quality to process all the information. He's just a, a data collector, right? He's just a, you know, um, I don't know what he's an encyclopedia, but he's not a poem. Is that, is, did I just, I crossed some metaphors there, right? Oh yeah. Somebody, yeah. Uh, somebody in chat, right? He, he didn't have an imagination. He didn't have, he lacked something, of his core being. And I, I think that's an interesting idea, right? I think that's a very interesting idea. Of course, we're going to see that. We've already spoiled it, right? With data, right? We're going to see some of this, you know, he lacks something um, that humans or beings like humans, like some of the other alien species in Star Trek, you know, possess. 
And it is also a corollary right to um, to Spock, right? It's the, or is it corollary? It's the exact opposite of Spock, right? Spock is always trying to deny his emotions, trying to push a certain part of his humanity, a certain part of his being away from himself, trying to close that down, trying to um, uh, push that away where V'ger is trying to experience it, right? And we get that, we get that reversal with data as well. And we're talking about data a lot. We're going to talk about data more um, in a bit. So we get that. So um, also, of course, Star Trek here, uh, V'ger, um, we've kind of already seen Vidra already when I mentioned the original series Nomad. Uh, Nomad is very similar to Vidra, right? Um, we're kind of doing a, a bit of a, a remake <laughs> here, right? Uh, Nomad was an Earth probe, encountered alien intelligence, became something else, developed something else. Vidra turns out to be Voyager. Um, I don't know why a sentient race of computers can't, you know, clean a little smudge off of a, a plate, but whatever. Um, uh, but so they think his name is V'ger and they repair him, but they actually give him the ability, you know, him, it, whatever it is, the ability to, you know, to expand, expand beyond, way beyond its capabilities. Um, and that's where, you know, it's looking for, I need to grow. I need to do something else because I can amass knowledge, but I'm, I'm not complete without that part. So that, that really does pick up a, an interesting theme in when we think about AI, when we're writing or when we're running games or uh, in that is just like, it does AI have everything it needs to be sentient? Can you be sentient without emotions? Or, you know, I don't know. Uh, but it's it's interesting, right? I mean, it's it's something to think about, and that's why we're kind of well, that's why we're here, right? <laughs> I want to think about it um, and think about some of these portrayals. All right. Also, 1979, we get Alien, right? So, what do we have in Alien? We have Ash, <laughs> right? We have these um, we have these androids that just look basically human right they they don't even know right like he's just an android and some of the people don't even know right and um so we have this you know just androids that look absolutely human but if they malfunction they kill y'all right like <laughs> that's that's what happens when they malfunction right um so you know just kind of another in interesting portrayal here of AI um, that can look very human, right? Um, unlike V'ger, who doesn't look human at all, but he still has some of these drives and still has some some bits of either humanity or something else. But here in Alien, it just looks like a person. Um, if, if it malfunctions, it goes bad, right? <laughs> it goes really, really bad. Um, all right, well, we stick with the same director. So we went, uh, Alien was directed by Ridley Scott. Uh, Blade Runner is directed by Ridley Scott, um, 1982, of course, based on the Philip K. Dick story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, I think. Electric Sheep, or is it Electronic Sheep? But either one. Um, so this is what Blade Runner is, is based on. And of course, here we get the replicants, right? Very famous, obviously, right? Very famous, um, uh, depiction of androids. And this is also playing into, right, the idea of um, we have Roy, uh, played by Rugger Hauer, who is like, I've seen things. I've done things. I've experienced things you can't imagine. But they built in uh, a lifespan of only a, a few years or whatever it was. And so I'm just going to die. And, you know, that's an interesting, that's an interesting idea, right? Because of course, again, here, kind of following a similar pattern, we build the replicants to do jobs we don't want to do, right? They can go to, 
wherever it was, I'm forgetting where it was, IO or, or whatever, they can go to these moons and, you know, in harsh environments and we don't care if a thousand of them, you know, are incinerated in a, in a salt volcano or whatever it is, or cryo volcano or whatever they are. We don't care because they're just doing jobs to get our minerals or, or whatever we need. Um, so that's the idea here. But of course, right, the replicant starts thinking, you know, kind of maybe passing beyond its programming, right? And that's a very, you know, an obvious, a very common theme among, you know, among AI, right? This emergent behavior, right? Is it going to emerge? Or are we going to have something emerge out of this behavior, uh, you know, out of these, this computer or these androids, we're going to have something emerge out of them. Uh, obviously an interesting film. I can't talk about it here, but it's been written about, talked about, you know, kind of at length. Um, uh, but just, uh, you know, obviously a, a portrayal of AI. All right. So Knight Rider, right. We, I, I threw this one back in because, you know, as a television show, right. It had, a lot of popular influence, right? TV shows are just on and you can just watch them. So, you know, movies you have to seek out, or at least in the 80s, right? Um, you had to seek them out. So we get Knight Rider on TV. What's interesting about this is that the car, of course, is an AI, you know, Kit is an AI very pleasant sounding voice right he he can drive himself oh self driving cars right he can he can do a, a lot of these things that we you know we've been talking about but you know that we've seen kind of you know evolve here in our present day technology but of course um nothing like kit really exists right and this kind of plants the idea i think some of these you know some of this, the fiction that we consume and the, you know, some of the stories we can consume kind of prepare us for an idea, right? Um, why, why are so many people like thinking, you know, chat GPT or the next iteration could become sentient? Probably because they watched a lot of these movies, right? <laughs> they watched a lot of these TV shows, right? These, this fiction kind of prepares us for the kind of the idea of something like that happening. Um, and to, to betterment or, you know, or to its, you know, whether it's, it's even possible or not, right? Since we've experienced fiction like that, it makes it a possible idea. Um, and so I think as popularizing AI, I know this popularized it for me when I was a kid, um, my age being my age, right? I watched Knight Rider when I was a little kid on TV. I was what, eight or, or so, um, when it was on TV at nine, eight or nine. And, um, I just, I thought our cars would talk to us one day, right? Um, and be intelligent and be our friends, right? And, you know, I got some of it wrong. They do talk to us and um, they possibly can drive us, even though there's been setbacks with that. Um, but they can't really talk like Kit, right? And Kit was different. Kit was, he seemed to have a lot more ability, right? He seemed to be more sentient, at least on the scale or on a spectrum of sentience. He seemed to be quite aware of himself and that he was a car. <laughs> um, but an interesting thing, portrayal of AI nonetheless um, in the form of a Trans Am or a Firebird. Was it Firebird or Trans Am? Trans Am. All right. So moving on uh, here to War Games, 1983. So again, here is another kind of Cold War take on AI, so we're going to create this computer that's gonna control all of our um, nuclear warheads. And uh, we're going to let a teenage hacker just hack into it. <laughs> that's what we're gonna let happen. Um, and um, I'm talking a little silly here, but this, this movie's great, right? War Games is a great movie. If you haven't seen War Games, please see War Games. So um, uh, it should be on some streaming service. I don't know where it's available now, but War, War Games is an awesome movie. Um, and it really deals with the AI, you know, 
in its limited, more limited capacities, right, where we have to really reason with it, where we have to really tell it what to do, and we have to kind of back out of its programming, because once it's told to do something, it initiates it, right, and you have to back out, um, you know, you have to try to figure it out, you know, why is it doing this, how can we get it to stop, it doesn't, it can't reason very well. It's just doing what it's told, right? Um, and um, in the movie, the computer, it has some acronym name, but it's it's Joshua, right? The programmer um, named it, um, the programmer named it after his son, I, I believe. I think it was his son who died or something like that. He named it after him. Uh, Okay, somebody in chat says War Games is on AMC Plus. So if you haven't seen it, please check it out. Um, probably could rent it from Amazon as well. They usually have everything there. Um, check it out. War Games is is a great movie, um, and it really leans into that idea. Like I was saying, like a, the AI is very limited in its reasoning, but so it has to be taught things and of course it war games is going to give us a message about nuclear war and anybody who's seen that knows what that message is right um if the game is dumb don't play <laughs> right <laughs> and so uh war games is a great movie and uh, dealing with the supercomputer idea um again all right um terminator 1984 um uh, this movie has been done to death. I'll be giving a presentation on storytelling in Terminator tomorrow on Gen Con Online, uh, talking about more of the writing behind the story and the story structure of it. But um, looking at AI here, right, of course, we have kind of the classic AI, right? The one who who rises up, becomes sentient, and decides mankind needs to be terminated, needs to be you know, getting gotten rid of because they are the problem. And so, um, you know, I probably don't need to describe the story or anything to you, but um, it is interesting that the Terminator, right? The, the robot himself here played by Arnold Schwarzenegger here um, doesn't appear you know, doesn't appear to be wholly sentient, right? He has a lot of reasoning capability. He has a lot of, a lot of, you know, if then this, that, you know, or kind of, you know, if then statements, right? You know, like where he's like, mm, need to do this, need to wear a disguise, need to track over here, need to look up this. So he has high level reasoning, um, seems to have very high level reasoning capability, but I don't know if he's fully sentient. So, um, I also don't know then, you know, we're never given, you know, too much detail about Skynet, especially in the first, you know, movie. But we, you know, Reese tells us about Skynet, powerful, intelligent, right? And decided our fate that we were were worthless and need to be eliminated, right? Um, kind of another take, um, you know, just another example of of people, <laughs> you know, of AI wanting to destroy humanity seems to be a very common theme, right? Um, it's they're either our servants, they're either uh, want to destroy us, or, you know, uh, and that's about actually, that's about it, right? There's very little, uh, you know, or they want to be us, I guess that would be that would be data, which we're going to get to here in a minute. Um, um, but Terminator, obviously, another classic example of. AI, machines become smart, machines want us dead kind of thing here. All right, I, I threw this one in, Daryl here, 1985. I threw this one in not because it is, you know, a spectacular film or anything like that. You know, it's not earth shattering movie um, by any means, but um, I think it is interesting it, it, how it goes a long way to like humanize AI, right? To make AI seem very, very human. Because what do you do? Oh, you 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 make it a kid, right? You make the AI a kid, um, and uh, then people want to, you know, will feel sorry for him, feel compassion towards him, and that, um, 
And then, so then when people want to turn him off, people are upset, right? People are like, no, don't turn off Daryl. Daryl is my friend, <laughs> right? And so, um, uh, you know, if you haven't seen this one, don't, you know, don't go out and watch it and tell all your friends about it or something and then watch it and then realize it's kind of a, you know, an, just an okay run of the mill movie or, something, you know, or whatever. So I'm not saying it's a great, you know, great cinematic, you know, gem or anything like that, but it, you know, uh, not like the Colossus, the Forbin project is a, a kind of a forgotten gem in some regards. Um, but this one, I think it just goes into the idea of the, of making AI human, right? We're going to humanize the AI. We're going to make it, you know, a child so we can feel compassion for them. And I think that goes into a long way into, you know, it affects a lot of the stories that we tell about AI. I think it just kind of goes into the cultural background, if you will, and um, where we kind of dealing with a lot of AI um, in the news and all of that. All right, Aliens, 1986. I'm going to have to speed up here. Again, this is James Cameron. So we he went from Terminator to doing the sequel to Alien. Um, instead of Ash, this time we get Bishop, played by Lance Hendrickson, who is awesome. Um, and uh, we get a little different take, right? Um, uh, Bishop is actually... Uh, pretty cool he's pretty cool in this right um he helps uh he helps uh i think he saves ripley and newt and um sacrifices himself if i'm remembering i it's been i, I watched it uh, I, I wasn't able to watch it i apologize in preparation for this but um i watched it i think a year or so ago but um so we get bishop in that regard where he actually helps people and he wants to you know he's he's a kind of a good character in that regard all right, Flight of the Navigator, also 1996. A lot of conversions in the 80s on AI, intelligent machines. So we get Max, who is kind of the AI controller of the advanced uh, uh, spaceship here in Flight of the Navigator. Um, um, just another, you know, portrayal where the AI is good and the AI, you know, is helpful and is kind of, you know, given human kind of characteristics through, you know, kind of moving its head and stuff like this. And um, um, uh, kind of interesting, um, you know, kind of an interesting, you know, a little bit more comedic, a little bit more for kids. But I think, again, it goes into popularizing AI, it goes into popularizing uh, the humanness of an AI. All right, Space Camp 1986, again, I threw this one in. Um, you can see the little robot here over Kate, uh, over, uh, you know, next to, uh, Kate Cap, uh, is that Kate Capshaw? And then, um, uh, uh, Leah Thompson right above Leah Thompson right there. Um, Jinx, uh, NASA just has sentient AI comic relief bots, you know, tooling around their labs. They just do, uh, just AI, just sentient AI robots. Just there they are. They're just in NASA. Also, if you see the the little uh, the little boy in front here, that is Joaquin Phoenix. Um, then credited as, as Leaf Phoenix, but he's that is Joaquin Phoenix and his feature film debut. Um, but yeah, NASA just has sentient robots lying around. You know, they just they're just there, just dime a dozen. All right, 1986 again. Oh my gosh, what was it about 1986? Um, Johnny Five's alive, right? Johnny Five gets struck by lightning. He malfunctions, and then he becomes sentient. Um, that kind of picks up a theme as well that um, anytime AI malfunctions, they become sentient. <laughs> um, that's just kind of a, a theme in some movies and TV shows. It's just they become sentient uh, whenever they malfunction. So we get Johnny Five is alive. Another, I think, another reason why you know, you know, very humanized, right? The AI is very made very human like. He has, even though, you know, he he's you know a, like a machine, like a killing machine robot. But he has some very uh, human like features, and they can make him seem human with his little flaps and and stuff like that. I'm gonna have to speed up, and this is the last slide here. I I was able to. Um, uh, you know, have to kind of cut this short a little bit because I realized there were so many uh, 
instances of TV shows and movies with an AI in them. So obviously we get to Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, by far, we get to Data, right? Data, I think, has shaped the popular imagination, at least in the United States, I think by a, a long shot, right? You know, it's gone. It has shaped our popular imagination about who data is and what data, you know, what AI is, um, right? And not in least part because of the amazing episode of Measure of a Man, where data is on trial to be to, to determine if he is sentient. Amazing, amazing episode. Um, I think that has gone into shaping, um, you know, shaping kind of our perception of AI a lot because data is such a cool character, right? He is such a, such a, a, a fascinating character, right? He's, he wants to be human. He wants to learn what our emotions are. He wants to learn those things because he feels limited in some way, feels limited in some way, but he's sentient, right? Like, it is very interesting. I think obviously Brent Spiner did an amazing job playing him. Um, just, you know, grand slam on the character all the way around. Um, and some of the episodes where he struggles with, you know, being a machine are, are quite good, um, quite good. And so, like I said, I knew this was going to go long. We only have about four minutes left. I would like to take some questions um, in that we can... I thought I saw a couple come up in chat. Um, not sure, but please really quickly. Um, like I said, I wanted just to look at some of these and kind of point them out in a format like this. I can't really dive, you know, you know, too deeply into them. I wanted to touch on some films where they talked about uh, AI and robots and how they were treated and if they're sentient. Uh, most seem to be sentient or become sentient, um, or that's the crux of the story, or trying to be completely human. On the flip side, they already are sentient and they want to destroy us <laughs> and kill humans. Um, any questions or anything? Um, like I said, we have about four minutes. Please type them in the chat. I have everybody on mute. Uh, will a recording be available later? Absolutely. I am recording this right now. Um, I will upload a recording maybe later tonight uh, to my YouTube channel and I'll post a link in um, I will post a link in the chat or the messages uh, at, at Gen Con online. So the link will be there. Okay, so how much of what we've seen causes the uncanny valley effect? Um, oh man, I'm gonna need a refresher on uncanny valley. Um, uncanny valley. Um, I have heard of the term uncanny valley. Okay, well, it's almost human to okay, yeah. So something that is almost human but that 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 gives a human response right uh, you know that we get an emotional or amplified a human response right right if we see something that looks almost human we're like what is that yeah i get that i think um i i think that is true i think people are playing on that right i think people are playing on that with say johnny 5 they play on it with um Jinx, the little robot in space camp, they play out, they give a human ish look. And then that allows us to think of it as being more human. Okay. Somebody who also asked, who are some of your favorite AI characters in shows or movies that have been released in the last five or 10 years? Do you think their portrayals changed in the last decade? Yeah. Um, this is a very interesting question because I, I just totally ran out of time. I, I, I would need to make a part two and part three and part four of this seminar to talk to them. Um, I think there have been some interesting portrayals in the last few years. I'm trying to remember in the last five or 10 years. Um, oh my gosh. I've just blanked out. I'm trying to remember some portrayals in the last few years. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, most everything shows the AI to be sentient. Um, that if I'm remembering, um, well, it's 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 20 years ago, but say AI by Spielberg with um uh another a child AI um looks very human, right? Elicits compassion instantly, right? Um uh so that one that was a, that that movie is actually 
it, it's a bit flawed here or there. I think it came out in 2000 or 2001. Really interesting take on AI in, in that movie as well. Um, last 10 or 15 years, I know there was Westworld. I haven't seen the remake of Westworld um, to comment on that. Um, what shows have I watched with AI characters in the last few years? Um, oh my gosh, I am sorry. I'm coming up with a blank. Is there any anybody out there has seen in the last few years that they thought was interesting? maybe the last decade or so um i'm trying to remember what was um oh uh blade runner uh blade runner uh 2049 right uh, uh you know obviously uh blade runner the sequel to blade runner right um uh they go in right that pushes it even further right the ai can have babies with humans ah <laughs> right like what like what in the world um so those replicants are actually you know they are becoming a new species right a new part of humanity at that point and so that one i guess was that the last decade i think that was the last decade right um so the the blade runner sequel uh, it was it was it 2049 i think um that very fascinating film portrayal there um and uh, of that of that ai and it does look like we are about one minute over i'm sorry i talk so much um i hope you found this interesting um and just kind of a, a quick overview of how ai has been portrayed um in film and television hopefully it gave you some movies or tv shows to check out um again um i will I will upload the recording of this to my YouTube channel, which is just Dice Geeks. I will put the link in the um, uh, the uh, chat or the messages on Gen Con online later tonight or tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for spending an hour with me talking about awesome movies. And um, I will see you tomorrow. I have four seminars on Gen Con online tomorrow. If you uh, found this one interesting. Hopefully you, you'll check those out. Um, so thank you so much. Have a great night and a good Gen Con.